find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. You see, the issue of how long God took to do it is not really the main point. That's a very important issue, but the main point is, can we take the Bible seriously? Can we believe what God says? And you see, if God had decided to create it over billions of years, I'd be okay with that. But the fact that he says very clearly in his word that he did it, okay? And when we add up those genealogies, we get it somewhere between 6,000, maybe 10,000. Let's even stretch it, say, 20,000 years, just to push our luck a little bit. But we're not talking millions and billions of years. We're talking the very young earth. God says that he did it in six literal days. And that's really the issue of our talk this evening. Well... Unfortunately, it's not only it, the atheists have, fig, have it figured out, but it seems that the Christians don't. And there's something that's called Evolution Sunday. It was celebrated on February 23, 2006. It was the 197th birthday of uh, celebration of uh, Charles Darwin's 197th birthday. And uh, this is the culmination of the Clergy Letter Project, which was a collection of over 10,000 signatures by mainline clergy. And here's what they say. This is the statement they put together. Many of the beloved stories found in the Bible, the creation, Adam and Eve, Noah and the ark, convey timeless truths about God, human beings, expressed in the only form capable of transmitting these truths from generation to generation. Religious truth is of a different order from scientific truth. We believe that the theory of evolution is a foundational scientific truth we ask that science remain science and that religion remain religion, two very different but complementary forms of truth. Now, I was under the impression that if something is true, it doesn't really matter what category it falls into. But notice here clearly what these would-be Christians are saying is that the creation, Adam and Eve, Noah and the Ark, these are no better than Aesop's fables. These are myths, if you will. There's something that God gave to us so that we could learn stories, we could learn important principles about Him. But we're not supposed to look at Adam and Eve as real, literal people. We're not supposed to look at Noah and the ark as Noah being a real person, the ark being a real structure that he spent 120 years building and that God sent that worldwide flood. Nor are we to believe that God actually did the creation as He, as he said in Genesis. These are things that we can glean from to learn about God, but these are not the main point. These are just moral stories of what they're telling us. But it's ironic that Charles Darwin himself said that I am quite conscious that my speculations run quite beyond the bounds of true science. So while you have the so-called Christians claiming that evolution is the truth and that it is a foundational scientific truth, Charles Darwin himself said that I know that it's speculations beyond the bounds of true science. And here's an amazing and very uh, interesting <coughs> admission by L.H. Matthews. He writes here in the introduction to Charles Darwin's book, Origin of the Species. This is the 1971 edition. He says, the fact of evolution is the backbone of biology, and biology is thus in the peculiar position of being a science founded on unproven theory. Is it then a science or a faith? Belief in the theory of evolution is thus exactly parallel to belief in special creation. What an amazing admission that this, this fact, this backbone of evolution is what it, biology is based on, but it's a science that's founded on unproven theory. And so he's admitting that just like those, those creationists who believe that God did it, but if we go back far enough, we have to take a step of faith. There's, he's saying that that's the same thing that evolutionists do. We can go back so far, and then we have to take a step of faith because there's nothing to support it. And what we're going to see is that there's a lot more that supports creation, and there's really nothing that supports evolution. Well, when we're looking at the views of biblical creation, we really have two choices. We have the God alone. God did it without evolution. He did it in six literal days, several thousand years ago, as the Bible teaches. And then the other flavor is God plus evolution. 
and we have uh, three categories. We have theistic evolution, we have gap theory, and then we have progressive creationism. Theistic evolution essentially purports that God got the, got the clock wound up, and then he let it go, <coughs> and now God is on the other side of the universe doing something else, and he's not paying any attention to what's going on within this universe. Ev the ev uh, evolution has run its course and, and is still going. Gap theory suggests that no, those six days of creation are literal, but we still need to somehow account for those billions of years for geological time. And so they put it between <coughs> Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that they were supposedly, supposedly uh, billions of years. And then progressive creationism purports that God has been active throughout the six day ages of, crea of uh, creation, but he was using evolution to do that. And every once in a while he would then start a new phase in his creative process, but of course evolution was the, the means by which he was doing that. And so these are the three flavors of uh, God plus evolution that you have. But really, how can we decide which of these is correct? How can we decide if it's the God alone or if it's God plus evolution? How can we decide what is correct? Well, we're going to use three different, uh, three different uh, areas of uh, criteria tonight. We're going to look at the Bible, the Word of God, and see what it has to say. We're then going to look at the church fathers and the ancient uh, Jewish commentators and understand what they had to say about this issue. And then lastly, we're going to look at that question of the dinosaurs. You see, if we believe in a young earth, we're confronted with this problem. What about those dinosaurs anyway? You see, we're told by the evolutionists that the dinosaurs ruled the earth some 225 million years ago, and then around 65 million years ago, mysteriously they just died off. And so if we are going to believe in a young earth, we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with those dinosaurs? Where do we put them? And so those will be the three areas that we look at tonight to decide which is correct. Well, first of all, before we go any further, we have to understand how do we interpret the Bible? How do we interpret Genesis? Because this becomes a very important uh, factor in determining how to read it. Well, lucky for us, and this is of course no accident, that the Bible interprets itself. And I'm going to prove that to you right now. Notice here in Jeremiah 25, it says, And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then it will come to pass when seventy years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity, says the Lord. So God himself is speaking. He's speaking by the mouth of Jeremiah. He's saying that the children of Israel be taken away captive for a period of 70 years. Now the big question is, what does he mean by 70 years? Is that just a metaphorical or a symbolic or a figurative or an allegorical type of number? And does years really mean years? Does it mean what, what it actually says here? Well, we have a later... Uh, author, Daniel, about 70 years later, he's reading the book of Jeremiah, and he says, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So approximately 70 years after the writing of the book of Jeremiah, Daniel's looking in, in that book, and he's saying, hey, you know what, I think that the clock, the calendar, is almost up. We're almost out of here. We get to go home pretty soon because 70 years are, are, are just about up. So he's getting very excited. This means we get to go home. We're done. He's looking at 70 and he's saying 70 really means 70 and that years really means years. And he's not understanding it to be some allegorical kind of figure or a figurative uh, number, but those are uh, very real increments and units of time. And then we have the writer of Second Chronicles. He is reading the same thing. He's coming to the same conclusion. He says, Nebuchadnezzar carried away to Babylon, where the Jews became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years, that the mouth, word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. This was written approximately 450 B.C. And notice again, we have a biblical author interpreting a previous biblical author and saying that 70 really means 70, years really means years. Now this is extremely important to understand because you have here, and there's 
countless others that we could we could look at. But, and uh, of course, I detail these in my book. But where biblical authors go back to a previous biblical author and they interpret those to be literal units of time and literal numbers. And so we can take this same principle and we go back to Genesis and then we say, all right, this is talking about real units of time. So let's do that. Let's go back and let's see what that has to say. Well, the biblical usage of the word uh, day or Hebrew word yom, how is it used in scripture? Now it is used for both a definite and an indefinite period of time. Let's first of all look at the indefinite instances. It's used in three different ways. The first one is time in the past, such as back in those days by Yemin Ahem. And that is really what we say in English as well. It's a, it's a parallel expression between English and Hebrew. Well, back in those days, back in my days. And of course, we're not talking about literal 24-hour periods. But we're talking about in my era, my time. It's also used to refer to a specific time of theological or eschatological significance. For example, the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord is talking about the tribulation, that's talking about a seven year period, it's certainly not talking about a 24 hour day. Okay, so here you have the day of the Lord, it's not talking about a 24 hour period. It's used 13 times in the scripture, Yom Adonai. And then lastly, it can be the span of someone's life. You see here in Genesis 5:4. <coughs> so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. That's Yom or Yamei Adam. And this is referring, of course, not to 24-hour uh, periods, but to all of his life. He, of course, it says that, that all of the days of his life. And so here, these are being used as uh, not literal periods, but as uh, indefinite periods of time. But the, the big distinction comes when we put a number in front of that. And it can be a, ordinal, a cardinal number or an ordinal number. It doesn't make any difference. We see here in Numbers 11, uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 20, you shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month. As you recall, the children of Israel were getting pretty sick and tired of eating manna. See, now we want something a little bit uh, with more pizzazz. And so God said, okay, you're getting tired of what I'm giving you. I'll give you meat. You want meat? I'll give you meat. But not just for one day or two days or five or ten or even twenty, but for a whole month. And he says, so much until it comes out of your noses, I'll give you so much to eat. You see? But notice here that every time you have the word day, you have a number in front of it. Okay, so these are talking about real, literal periods of time. And, of course, it's, it's juxtaposed with the word month. So there shouldn't be any question that these are talking about literal periods of time. So here's the rule for you. Anytime you put a number in front of the word day, it always limits it to a definite period of time, to a 24-hour period of time. And there's no exception for that. And we see the same principle with ordinal numbers. Now, cardinal numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4. Ordinal numbers are 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, etc. And so here, from the same book of Numbers, we see here, on the second day, Yom HaShini, present 12 young bulls. On the third day, Yom HaShlishi, present 11 bulls. On the fourth day, Yom HaRevi'i, present, and then etc. And it goes on and on. And what's exciting about this passage is it's in the same language as we have in Genesis 1. We have there, we have day one, then we have the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. And this is the same language in Hebrew as we have in Genesis. So again, we are interpreting these to be literal periods of time. They understood that they were supposed to do something specific on a certain day, and that was what God is prescribing. It's the same language that we have in Genesis. So again, why should we interpret that any differently? And in fact, God is so clear, He wanted us to understand that so abundantly, that He even said it twice for us. And where something is said twice, we're told that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, something shall be established. And so it's almost like God wants to get his point across so that we can't miss it. And so he says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And again, just in case we didn't get it, he says, Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Now do you think the Jews were back there scratching their heads saying, 
gee, does that mean I'm supposed to work for about six billion years, and then I get to take a billion years off? Do you really think that that's what they were wondering? Or do you think they said to themselves, no, I'm supposed to work six 24-hour periods, and then I get to take a 24-hour period, the seventh 24-hour period, off. That's my reward. Now, they understood that if they didn't, if they broke that commandment, what was going to happen to them? They were going to get stoned. Now, in California, it's not kind of nice to get stoned, but back then it wasn't nice to get stoned, okay? It really hurt, and it ruined your day, okay? So I know there are a lot of ex-hippies here, and that sounded pretty good, but that wasn't a reward back then, okay? And so they understood that there was a very serious consequence if they were working. So they understood what these days meant. So here's what God's saying. Listen, you guys are working for 24, six 24 hour periods. Why? Because that's how long I worked. Now think about it. Was that a big deal for God to do it in six 24 hour days? No. In fact, I think it, actually I think it was a big deal. Because I think God was really taking his time. He was slowing himself down so much when he could have gone like that and just had the whole thing done and said, look what I did in just a step of my fingers. He said, you know, I'm taking it take six days. Why? Because I want to create a model for them to live by. So God, I think God did it, you know, it, he did it in a very slow manner. He did it in six 24-hour days. Can you believe it? He took his time. Now here's an objection you've been wanting to ask me. Yes, but what about that passage in 2 Peter 3.8? It says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Doesn't that just kind of undermine everything that I just said? Well, notice here, first of all, it says, with the Lord. This isn't man's perspective. This is God's perspective. Peter is encouraging his listeners, hey guys, don't forget. The way God sees things is not the way we see things. So first of all, this is with the Lord, it's his perspective. And secondly, there's that little word, it's the Greek word hos, and it means as, it can also mean like. It's not an equal sign. See, what happens is a lot of people come to this and they say, oh, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, so it doesn't really mean anything. Or you can mean it whatever you want it to mean. Well, that's not true. This is a simile. It's not an equal sign. You cannot make an equation out of this. Okay, you cannot make an equation. One thing is similar to another, but they're not the same. Okay, so from God's perspective, a day, a thousand years, doesn't make any difference. From man's perspective, very different. Very different. And notice here, this is taken from Psalm 90, verse 4, <coughs> where it says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and a watch in the night. So again, this is God's perspective that's in view, and it's not man's perspective. So... Uh, just keep that in mind. So as we summarize the biblical evidence, we saw that the biblical interpret the Bible interprets itself literally. Day is always a 24-hour period whenever it has a number in front of it. Doesn't matter if it's an ordinal number or a cardinal number. If it's got a number, it's a 24-hour period. If it doesn't have a number in front of it, then it can be an indefinite period, and that's true. But again, when talk comes to creation, we always find numbers in front of those days, and so they're 24-hour periods. And so therefore, we conclude that the days of Genesis were literal based on the biblical evidence. Now we come to the ancient Jewish and Christian commentators. And here's where we might want to just consider something for a second. What if all of them believed that God created over long periods of time? If that were true, then we might want to say, is there something wrong with this thesis that we're pulling out of the Bible? Could it be that all of the ancient commentators came to a conclusion very different, at least what I've come to, and I hope maybe you'll come to as well, then if that were the case, then we might want to say, okay, maybe we missed something. But see, the reality is that all of them, with the exception of one guy, come to the conclusion that they were talking about literal periods of time. The one exception, his name is Origen. Uh, he turns out to be a little bit of a heretic. He believed that... that God the Father created God the Son, who in turn created God the Holy Spirit. And for me personally, somebody who gets that wrong, I don't really care what he has to say about creation. Because he gets the most important thing wrong. Well, now looking at uh, progressive creationist Dr. Hugh Ross, he's probably the foremost spokesman for the progressive creationist camp. He says this. He says, many of the early church fathers and other biblical scholars interpret the creation days of Genesis as long periods of time. Now this is a very interesting quote, because 
Here is uh, the list of uh, some of the people that he talks about. Josephus, Philo, Arrhenius, Justin Martyr, Hippolytus, Clement of Alexandria, Basil, Augustine, etc. And so he's, suggest he's saying that all of these people believe that those days were long periods of time. And I just thought, well, let's just go and see who, you know, what they really have to say. So we start with Josephus. He's the first person on his list. And Josephus says in his monumental book, Antiquities of the Jews, he says, containing the interval of 3,833 years from the creation to the death of Isaac. Now, personally, when I read that, it didn't make me think that he was an old earther. It sounded to me like he believed that the earth was young. Because if you go from the creation to the death of Isaac, and it's only 3,833 years, that's a fairly young earth. That's certainly not millions or billions of years. And then he just comes right out and says it. He says, accordingly, Moses says that in just six days, the world and all that is therein was made. So again, he's not, he's not trying to you know, say something between the lines. He's just saying, hey, Moses said it was done in six years, or six days, and that's it. And it happened less than 4,000 years ago from his perspective. Okay? Now we turn to one of the early church fathers, Bar uh, Barnabas. He says, the Sabbath is mentioned at the beginning of the creation. He finished in six days. We come to Theophilus of Antioch. He says, Adam lived till he begat a son 230 years, and Noah's 600th year. The flood came. The total number of years, therefore, till the flood was 2,242. All the years from the creation of the world amount to a total of 5,698 years, and the odd months and days. Okay, so he's rounding off a little bit. But he's still saying that the earth, from creation until his day, from creation until his day is 5,698 years. Again, that's a very young earth. In fact, he goes on and he rebukes those that were saying that the earth was millions of years old. He says, concerning the number of years from the foundation of the world, there have neither been 20,000 times 10,000, that equals 200 million. I had to do the, the math on that one. And you know, I thought that was pretty amazing. That here we think that the hundreds of millions is a pretty new phenomenon, but this is what the church fathers were fighting back in their day. So there's really new, nothing new under the sun. He says, from the flood to the present time, as Plato said, nor yet 15 times 10,375 years, which is 155,625, nor is the world uncreated, <coughs> nor is there a spontaneous production of all things, which in modern terminology is called a biogenesis. That's what Darwin tried to uh, push on us, as Pythagoras and the rest dream. So he takes these people to heart. He takes them to task and says, listen, guys, there's not 200 million years, there's not 155,000 years. There's uh, not this a biogenesis stuff. That's not true, not from the Bible. So here you have a very important ancient source, an ancient uh, Christian father, early Christian father, and uh, he's saying, no, that's not true. Victorinus, God produced the entire mass for the adornment of his majesty in six days. In the beginning, God made the light and divided it in the exact measure of 12 hours by day and by night. Now, I had to do the math on this one, too. You guys can help me. 2 times 12 is 24. You see, I think that Victorinus believed that those days were 24-hour periods. It seems pretty clear to me that he was saying they're 24-hour periods, and they weren't long ages of time. But again, Victorinus was on Dr. Ross's list. And I just don't understand how he got on that list. I don't understand how any of these guys got on his list, because they didn't believe it. Lactantius. Plato and many others of the philosophers said that many thousands of ages had passed. They foolishly say that they <coughs> possess comprising their memorial 470,000 years. God completed the world in this admirable work of nature in the space of six days. Basil the Great, when there was evening and morning, one day, why did he say one and not first? He said one because he was defining the measure of day and night since 24 hours fill up the interval of one day. Again, a young earth creationist. Augustine, he's not exactly early, but he's an important voice. Reckoning by the sacred writings, we find that not 6,000 years have yet passed. Thomas Aquinas, uh, again, he's not an early church father, but he's an important voice, especially for the Catholic Church. He says, God called the light day, since the word day is also used to denote a space of 24 hours. And then we come to a wonderful quote by Martin Luther. And he says, we know from Moses that the world was not in existence before 6,000 years ago. He, Moses, calls a spade a spade, 
That is, he employs the terms day and evening without allegory, just as we customarily do. We assert that Moses spoke in the literal sense, not allegorically or figuratively. That is, that the world with all its creatures was created within six days, as the words read. So here Martin Luther is taking on those that would suggest anything else. There were some people in his day that were suggesting that it all happened in just a moment. And so he was kind of going the other direction. But it, it, it's still applicable as it, it's written. He's saying, listen, Moses wrote it without allegory, without allegory, without figurative language. We don't have to look between the lines. A spade is a spade. And then he goes on and gives a very good exhortation. If we do not comprehend the reason for this, let us remain pupils and leave the job of teacher to the Holy Spirit. And I think that's great advice. You see, what's happening is we're told that evolution is a fact. And because it's a fact, we have to find a way, you're burdened with a way to somehow get those millions and billions of years into the Bible if we're going to keep the Bible. But again, we saw that the, the atheists understand the issue, don't they? If we can get rid of the creation, get rid of Adam and Eve, and the original sin, what happens to the cross? It loses its entire foundation. It just falls over and is gone. So again, why should we believe that God raised a man from the dead? He raised Jesus Christ from the dead if he can't even get the Bible right. He can't get Genesis right. So that has very important implications. And then lastly, John Calvin, little more than 5,000 years have elapsed since the creation of the world. So all of these ancient commentators thought that they were uh, literal days of creation. Well, again, what about those dinosaurs? We've seen so far that just looking at the Bible, interpreting it literally, we see that when you have a number in front of the word day, it's literal. Okay? And then the, all the ancient commentators agree with that. You, know, you read it literally. If you don't get it, let the Holy Spirit figure it out. You'll get it eventually. But then what do we do with those dinosaurs? We know they're dinosaurs. <coughs> they're just uh, tons and tons and tons of fossils out there. There's no question that they were really dinosaurs. But how do we fit those into the Bible? Well, here's what uh, evolutionist Louis Jacobs, professor of geological sciences and president of the Institute for the Study of Earth and Man at Southern Methodist University. Here's what he says. The co-occurrence of men and dinosaurs would dispel an earth with vast antiquity. The entire history of creation, including the day of the rest, could be accommodated in the seven biblical days of the Genesis myth. Evolution would be vanquished. So he's kind of putting out a double dog dare. He's saying, listen, if you guys can find men and dinosaurs living together, if you can prove that, then evolution is toast. It's history. It'll be vanquished. Well, let's take him up on it. Let's see if we can find any evidence of dinosaurs and men together. First of all, let's start with dinosaurs in the Bible. Do we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Well, no, we don't. We don't expect to see it because it wasn't coined until 1841. So we're not going to see it there because they didn't start finding these bones until the 1820s. And they said, hey, these are different. These aren't your, your normal lizards. And so they finally came up with a new term for them, terrible lizards or dinosaurus. And that's when the term was born. So we're not going to find the word dinosaur in scripture. But the Bible does speak of dinosaurs using three different terms. It uses the term taninim, leviathan, or behemoth, and then leviathan. And so we're going to look at these three this evening. Taninim is fine, we find is used 27 times in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. God created the great sea monsters. And in Hebrew, this is the word taninim. Now, there are some words in Scripture that can be a little bit tricky to figure out. What does this mean exactly? In some of your translations, it might say whale. Uh, it has the idea of just kind of an ordinary, but big uh, sea creature, sea monster, with a fairly good translation. Well, we can do something called comparative linguistics. And Hebrew is part of the Semitic family, just like Spanish is part of the Latin family. So if I don't understand a word in Spanish, I can go and look it up in French, or I can look it up in Italian, and I can do some comparative linguistics. And I can do the same thing with Hebrew in this language, Ugaritic. Ugaritic was the language of the people that uh, now live in Lebanon. They were the Ugaritic people, lived about 1400 BC. And uh, 
uh, Ugaritic is a Semitic language. It's a cousin of Hebrew. And this, this root, Taninim, in Ugaritic means the dragon, sea monster, uh, snake stretching out, moving forward like smoke. So when they, when the people of Ugarit said Taninim, this is the image that they had in their mind, some kind of a dragon or a sea monster. And then we can also do comparative linguistics with, um, with the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was done approximately 270 BC. And this word is translated as the word dracon. Dracon, of course, is dragon. And sometimes translated as the word kete, which just means monster. So there you have it. It can either be a dragon, and a dragon for Greeks so was some kind of a, maybe think of like a, a Chinese dragon that it was like a snake type uh, body with some legs on it. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a flying dragon that could do all kinds of magical spells and all of that kinds of stuff. But uh, it was a, a very large creature. And so that's how they understood this word. So here we have it. From the Ugaritic, they understood it to be a dragon. And from the Greek, they understood it to be a dragon. So here, on day five, God created the dragons. These would have been the, the sea dragons, or the probably the plesiosaurus, or some type of a, 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 a water dinosaur, really called plesiosaurus. But, uh, so that's the first instance of where we have a, a type of a dinosaur in scripture. We then come to Job 40. And you remember that Job was in a lot of pain. And his friends kept telling him all the things that he did wrong. And he said, well, why didn't God just come and tell me? So God shows up. He says, okay, Job, let's talk. And he says, look at here. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. Well, that's our first clue. This creature, behemoth, whatever it is, God made it along with Job. And secondly, it had to be around so that Job could look at it. It doesn't good do much good to say, look now at that extinct animal that I made. Because it's really hard to look at an extinct animal. It's not going to do you much good. Because you've never seen an extinct animal. Well, and then our next clue, it says that he eats grass like an ox. Now, if you look in your Bibles, you'll see that in many of them, there's a footnote that says that this could either be an elephant, a hippopotamus, or a crocodile. But could it really be any one of those three? Well, let's consider it. He eats grass like an ox. This is true for the elephant or the hippopotamus, but would it work for a crocodile? Well, first of all, crocodiles only eat meat, so that makes it pretty difficult. And secondly, imagine a crocodile trying to get its big jaws around some blades of grass. It's just going to be very, very difficult to do. Okay, so the crocodile doesn't fit, but what about the elephant or the hippopotamus? Well, it says that his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. Now, elephants and hippopotamuses are a lot stronger than we are, but the majority of the elephant's strength is in its upper body, and of course in its trunk. So its hips are not its, its most salient feature. And here's the, the real kicker though. He moves his tail like a cedar, and we'll come back to that in a second. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. And they've done studies and they've shown that every time an animal doubles in size, its bones only get stronger by a, a ratio of four. And that, bec that becomes uh, uh, important because of the bones have to get a lot stronger even though it's gaining so much more mass. It has to get a lot stronger uh, relative to the size of the animal. So this creature would have had to have extremely strong bones, and that's what God is telling us, is that his bones are like beams of bronze and his ribs are like bars of iron. It's very, very strong bones. Well, let's go back to that moves his tail like a cedar. Now, the cedar, for a biblical writer, was probably, he probably had the cedar of Lebanon in view. The cedar of Lebanon can grow up to 80 feet tall, 110 inches in diameter. Uh, very big tree indeed. But, well, of course, which of these makes you think of a tail like a cedar? Is it this one, the elephant? Is it this one, the Tronosaurus Rex? Or is it this one right here, the Argentinosaurus? Now, personally, this one right here makes me think of a tail like a cedar, or even here, the brontosaurus, you may not be able to see that very well. But the elephant's tail reminds me of a big fly swatter. I just can't imagine that that could be the tail of a cedar. Uh, it takes a lot of creative thinking to try to make that into the tail of a cedar. 
Now here, any of the giant sauropod dinosaurs weighing up to some 50 tons would have been a very good candidate to have a tail like a cedar. And then let's go to Leviathan. It says, his sneezings flash forth light and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning light, sparks of fire shoot out, smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and flame goes out of his mouth. Now I have to admit, the first time that I seriously read this passage, I thought to myself, okay, this has to be myth, okay? Because there's nobody. We just don't believe in fire-breathing dragons. That's just, that's just not possible. There's no way that that could be. This is, if that's what it's saying, you just read it literally, that's what you have the fire-breathing dragon. There's no way that can be. But then I started to think about some of God's truly amazing creatures. And I thought, well, you know, if God can make these little things, that, for instance, you can have a bug that has a little flashlight in its rear, that's pretty amazing. And you can have a creature that is under the water and it has even these moving lights. I mean, what does it use for those? Does it use uh, energizer batteries or the, the, the lights or those halogen lights? Or, you know, what are those? Are the LEDs? How can God do that? And then I started to think, you know, that's really not such a big deal for God to make some kind of a dinosaur that could have fire coming out of its mouth. And then I started even thinking about this one, the bombardier beetle. This is my favorite. Whenever this little creature starts to feel threatened, he emits some chemicals in his rear and puts them together. And then when the predator tries to come and eat, have him for lunch, he puts those together and boom, it uh, emits some kind of an explosion and he gets away. Now, I think that's really quite amazing. And again, if God can do those kind of things, I started thinking, you know, it's not such a big deal that he can make a fire-breathing dragon. In fact, they've done some studies and they've uh, suggested that uh, you know they had enough methane. They let out that methane. There actually is a a, uh, a mechanism that could create enough <coughs> friction in their throat. Let it out, and it turns into fire. So uh, many different possible ways. It might have been methane. It might have been different uh, chemicals in the head that were then let out, and maybe a little oxygen. You've got some, and you have fire. However, it was done. God thought it up, and if He can do these things, I'm sure He can. But, wouldn't it be nice, not just for this kind of evidence, but if we had some archaeological evidence that would really show us that there's evidence of men and dinosaurs living together. That would really just make us feel good. Of course, we believe the Bible, we, we can stand on the Bible, but it would just be nice if there was such a thing. Well, there is, and it's from the Nazca civilization, found in the Ica Valley of Peru. Uh, this is civilization around 700 uh, AD, and in 1961, there was a massive flood that went through the valley. Uh, the Ica Valley is a very, very dry area. It's actually drier than Egypt, and so you can just imagine how dry that is. And when this flood went through, it started to open up a lot of tombs. And in these tombs, they started to find some very exciting things. Uh, first of all, they found Grandma and the entire family. <coughs> And then they found, what, some, some textiles with an uh, image on there. It looks like to be some kind of a dragon or a dinosaur. Here's a ceramic, uh, again, some type of a dragon-like or dinosaur-like kind of creature. But then they also found these things called the Ica stones. They found over 15,000 of these to date. And they range anywhere from a few ounces up to 1,000 pounds. They take an average of 12 to 15 hours per stone to carve, and there are over 15,000 of these. Uh, so that takes a long time to carve, and this one right here is 250 pounds, and there are images on all five of, uh, of the sides. Here you can see a, uh, a dinosaur. Uh, this is, looks like a Diplodocus, this is the same one. You can see here that the, the ridges, these frills on the back, and they for a long time questioned what could those possibly be. Now they think maybe they were they helped to uh, keep the balance of the animal's uh, temperature. Uh, perhaps they were for uh, uh, self-defense, but they probably helped regulate the temperature of the animal. But again, the real problem is you have, first of all, you have these things, and then you have a man 
on the back of this thing. And of course, what's going to happen is the evolution will say, well, this can't be true. This is no way. These have to be fake. Because we know that dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. The earliest man, the earliest hominids, came on the scene about a million years ago. And those weren't even really human. These were just uh, before. And so there's no way that this could possibly be. But here is uh, Dr. Cabrera's collection, 11 to 12,000, or uh, how many he has. You can still go down to his, his, um, his uh, museum down there in Peru. And you can see that he just has walls and walls of, of these stones. Well, not all of them have, uh, have men and dinosaurs, uh, but a, a very large number have uh, dinosaurs on them. So again, how did they get on them? Was it some crazy creationist that just started carving away at these things and uh, trying to say, well, see, men and dinosaurs actually live together? Because again, these were, these, they started to find these back in 1961. What we, know, what we knew back in 1961 was a lot less than what we know today. In fact, here we can see a man of Triceratops. So we, can, we can see uh, some of the detail of the skin. Uh, very clearly, a Triceratops. It's got the three horns there, very distinctive of that animal. And then we come to this one. These are two, what look like to be two Allosauruses attacking a man. And they, uh, skeptics have said, well, what, you know, what are these things here? Are these just donuts or something? Or, you know, what are these concentric circles? Uh, why did they put those there? Well, it's interesting that it was only in the 1990s and, and 2000s that we began to discover what dinosaur skin looks like. We've, we've now found quite a bit of dinosaur skin. You can actually buy this specimen here uh, online for 3500 bucks. I think I'm going to pass, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it would be kind of fun, I suppose. You can see what looks like a circle right there. Okay, you can kind of see that little circle right there on, on the skin. And here is an artist's depiction of what that Allosaurus skin looked like. Uh, you, you can see those um, little concentric circles. Uh, they really are there. I know it's hard to see the, the lights are on, but um, this is what the modern understanding of Allosaurus skin looked like. And so it has those concentric circles. You see, what happens is the person that did this, this stone had a very good understanding of what Allosaurus skin looked like. Now, before I started studying any of, the, any of this, I would just, I don't know what kind I would do for dinosaur skin. I probably wouldn't do anything. You see, so the fact that there's something there tells you this person had a keen eye. Now maybe just for their day, you know, if I were to draw a Dalmatian, it wouldn't be a big deal because I know what Dalmatians look like. It's an ordinary animal. I can draw that thing. But this person probably took it for granted. Well, of course, all allosauruses have these concentric circles on their skin, and so he put them there. Maybe not enough, but he put enough to at least give you an idea, okay, this is an allosaurus that we're talking about. Allosaurus is a, a cousin to the Tyrannosaurus rex. And so again, very clear evidence that these are not hoaxes. Now, these were also taken to the laboratory. In fact, they were taken to two different laboratories by a man named Dr. Swift. He took them to two separate laboratories because he knew there'd be people that would uh, uh, be very skeptical. And what the laboratories found, independently of one another, is they found a heavy coat of patina on a stone that was found in situ. In other words, he went there, he dug it up himself, he took it to the laboratory, and they found this. And they found that there was a heavy coat of patina or patination on the entire stone. Not only on the stone itself, but deep down into the grooves. Now patina is a type of, of uh, varnish, and it, it accumulates over a long period of time. Kind of like when you see something that's antique, it's starting to get a little bit of that varnish on it. Well, patina just takes a lot longer, and it happens naturally. And so if there's patina not only on the stone, but on the carving itself, that tells you that the carving has to be of great antiquity. So that's a very significant find. They also found microorganisms in the grooves. Those take a long time to, to form. Uh, salt here is a mineral. Again, it takes a long time to form this mineral. And it's found in the grooves itself. Uh, lichen growth on one section uh, in the grooves. And then they also found an apparent blood stain over a dinosaur image. Now, blood, of course, is unfortunate for the person that lost it, but it's good for us because blood is a lot easier to date. And according to the laboratory, it says the stone is of some age, in fact, of antiquity of hundreds 
or thousands of years old. <coughs> so dating that blood, they are saying, no, this has to be this. This blood is very old. So what that tells you is what under whatever is underneath that blood has to be old as well. So it tells you that the image is old. So here you have some really rock solid proof that men and dinosaurs lived together. But there's a lot more as well. We have Acumbaro, Mexico. Uh, over about 50,000 clay figurines have been found. This is from the Chupicuaro civilization from about 580 to 500 uh, BC to 80, excuse me. And you can just get a, a range, a feel of the range of uh, dinosaur images there. On the top, you can see here is the iguanodon. Now, this uh, iguanodon is quite significant. Here's the modern understanding of how the iguanodon uh, looked like. And you can see that this tail is going straight out. That's very significant because back in 1895, this is what the, the conception of an iguanodon looked like. Notice where the tail is. It's right here dragging on the ground. This probably would not have been a creature that could have run too fast. Here's another depiction of it, again, see that tail on the ground. And so this really looks nothing like the artist's rendition of the iguanodon back in 1895 was nothing like what they understand it to be today. And so that tail going straight out is very significant because it tells you that the person that carved, that, uh, not carved, but uh, shaped this had a, a good understanding of what the Iguanodon looked like. We also go to Natural Bridges National Park, Utah. Uh, this is a petroglyph of the Anasazi who lived in the area from approximately 480 to 1380. And you can see here this looks like a giant sauropod. Uh, similar to the Brachiosaurus or Argentinosaurus or Apatosaurus, and one of those. And of course, over here is the man. Uh, question, what are they doing together on the same piece of rock? Uh, it's a good question. And then here in the Temple Monastery of Tapram, Cambodia, this was built by Jayavarman VII. This was in honor of his mother, and the temple was dedicated in 1186 AD. Okay, so that wasn't too long ago. Uh, and on the, there's reliefs on all the walls of just all kinds of ordinary animals. You have sheep, you have goats, you have uh, really all the animals that you find in the area. And then as we zoom in, we see on the top it looks like to be some kind of a deer, maybe a gazelle or something. But then we get a little closer on one of the bottom, and that looks like a stegosaurus. But again, what was a stegosaurus? doing back then. All the dinosaurs were supposed to have died out 65 million years ago. And yet here you have, in this temple, monastery, a stone carving of a stegosaurus. Now, was there some crazy creations that came in the middle of the night and they faced the animal that had been there and quickly carved in a stegosaurus overnight so that they could somehow prove that men and dinosaurs lived together? Is that what they're trying to do? Or, did the people that built this actually see a stegosaurus and they put it in there? Well, I think that they actually saw a stegosaurus. But of course, this begs the question of how can this be? Well, I, I purport that there are three different theories we can suggest. Man and dinosaurs actually lived together some 65 million uh, plus million years ago. That's according to the evolutionary time scale. But this doesn't really fit well for the evolutionists because again, you cannot have men and dinosaurs both in the same age. You see, the dinosaurs were kings of the earth. They were ruling over this earth for 225 or 50 million years, and then they died out. And when they died out, then the, the smaller animals, the mammals, and eventually you and us, then we had our chance to evolve and to have our day in the sun. You see, that's, that's why you can't have them both on the same planet at the same time because dinosaurs were bigger and stronger and they were more fit, essentially, for their habitat to live. And so you cannot have men and dinosaurs living together. That's the real problem. So this doesn't jive well with them. Well, how about this? Dinosaurs did not die out 65 million years ago, but continued until the time of early man one million years ago. Well, they don't like that one either. That doesn't work at all. And I think number three is the best. Men and dinosaurs lived together in the relatively near past let's say some 10,000 years ago. And you see, that's what we find the Bible's telling us, that God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh, and he did it approximately 6,000, maybe 10,000 years ago. And it was in the relatively, uh, the relative past, the 
the near past that he did it, and it wasn't all those millions and billions of years ago. The church fathers tell us that it was a, not a long time ago. And then we see that there's evidence of men and dinosaurs living together. And in fact, there's so much evidence that it's really ample to see. But it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes that many people don't want to see it. They would rather go on believing the lie than to admit that there's some evidence, in fact, good evidence, that men and dinosaurs live together and that the earth might actually be young, as the Bible says. So what we come to is that the six days really are enough. And again, why is this important? Well, go back to what we started with. What were the atheists telling us? If you can destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, you will see the sorry remains of the Son of God in the rubble. Okay. So again, if we get rid of the foundation of the Bible, if we get rid of Genesis, we say, you know what? It doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis. It doesn't matter if you think that those are literal times or literal days. You know, God maybe did it through evolution. If you start believing that, it's just going to be a matter of consequence until, maybe not you, but another generation is going to say, you know, why should I believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Why should I believe that God raised him from the dead and he died for my sins when I can't believe in the first book of the Bible? We've, we've so-called so disproven the first book of the Bible. Why should I believe this stuff about Jesus? You see, and that's why it's so critically important. Because we go from the curse, and we have those literal... Adam and Eve, that they literally listened to the, the serpent, and they literally disobeyed God's command, and they literally ate of that apple or whatever fruit it was, and then they, they fell. And then, see, then God gave a promise. He gave the promise of the Redeemer who would smite the enemy's head, you see, and that was given in Genesis 3.15. So if they were not real, then when did that happen? When did God give that promise? And then, of course, without that, we don't really have any basis for the cure. We don't have any basis for why Jesus had to die on the cross. Because if we're told that Matt, Adam and Eve never really sinned, then why did Jesus need to die in the first place? Why go through all that trouble? And so this becomes a very huge issue that we need. We saw that the Bible interprets itself literally. And when interpreted literally, those days of Genesis 1 and 2 have to be a literal period of time. They can't be anything else. It doesn't support any of the other theories. It doesn't support uh, the theistic evolution theory. It doesn't support the gap theory or the progressive creationist theory. And we saw that the Jewish and, biblical, uh, Jewish and Christian interpreters all understood that to be literal periods of time. We saw that dinosaurs are in the Bible and that there's archaeological evidence of them. And then we can conclude that the first six days were literal days and were more than enough time for God to create all the days. Now, if you're interested, uh, I've written uh, a book, two books, actually. Uh, the first six days is what I obviously just talked about tonight, and this is available. It's uh, $15. And this one is called Discovering the Language of Jesus, and there I um, point out that that Jesus' mother tongue was Hebrew, but not Aramaic, as is commonly reported. And so these are resources that I've written to defend the inerrancy of God's word. That's really my passion, that I want you to go away knowing that you can trust God's word. You don't need to compromise in any way. You can trust everything that God said. The big points, the smaller points, it's all true, and we can believe that God has told us what he's wanting to say. Are there any questions at this point? Yes. I had heard someplace that they had found tracks of both human beings and dinosaurs that were meshed together. In the, I believe it was the Pelosi River in Texas. Yeah, I think that was it. And uh, Dr. Carl Baugh uh, is the one that's uh, in his house. How do the scientists do with that one? Well, uh, <laughs> I was just speaking with somebody and he told me that uh, he, he met some of them. And they decided, they went there, but they decided not to look at the tracks. And they said if they didn't actually see the tracks, and they never, they aren't really there. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I believe it. I believe it. Uh, if you don't see it, then it doesn't really exist. You know? <laughs> uh, doesn't fit your paradigm. Why look at it, you know? Yeah. Um, do we have any secular historical documentation? to confirm the return of the Jews from Babylon two years from after the seven years? 
you're at the center of the universe of gravity. So if we are at the center of the universe of gravity, then everything that's happening at a further distance from that gravity, and he calls it a gravity well, will be going at a different speed. And to prove that, he talks about the two different uh, atomic clocks that we have, one in Greenwich, England, and one in Boulder, Colorado. I don't know if there are more than that, but he talks about those two specifically. And he talked about how they're, they're out of sync with each other by five microseconds per year. The one in Boulder, Colorado is a, a mile above sea level. And so it's ticking faster than the one at Greenwich, England. And these are atomic clocks. They're the most accurate clocks we have. In fact, uh, I have a friend, Dr. Stan Schuller, he was a retired uh, aerospace scientist, and he says that that uh, is even, uh, even uh, exacerbated when you go into space and put things up into space that it gets even worse that that time dilation you know so they have to always keep resetting their clocks <coughs> you put these satellites out in space and the difference between what's on earth and what's up there is even worse and so what he's saying is that you have earth standard time that things are happening here on earth at what we understand to be time at our rate but things that were happening away from the center of the, the gravity would be having a much faster clock speed than what we have going on here. And so that's how he would account for the difference <coughs> in how he could have uh, things happening at you know, much faster rates than what's happening on Earth standard time. Uh, the other person would be um, uh, Barry Setterfield, and uh, he just came, I don't know, four or five months ago and spoke at Calvary Chapel of Christa Mesa and he talked about plasma and I can only tell you very briefly about it because uh, it's pretty technical but it's sounded good. Uh, <laughs> basically, <laughs> uh, basically if you if you have water plasma, it starts with water plasma. Well, plasma, we think of plasma TVs, but he's talking about hot plasma. Plasma TVs are cold plasma. Uh, when, he talk, when he says hot, what he's talking about is is the, the fourth state of energy. Okay, we think of solids, liquids, and gases. Well, plasma is that fourth state where you have a superheated element, and talking billions of degrees, and so water at billions of degrees is going to behave much differently. In fact, it's going to travel at 1 times 10 to the 11th power faster uh, than it does now, the light from that. So based on that, uh, he has, you know, we got all his theories on how you know everything in those six Earth days would account for how you have what looks atomically to be billions of years. Okay, uh, and I thought that was interesting. But the one problem I kind of had with it, but I'm not nearly to his level to disagree with him. But uh, just a little flag that I had was, you know, he seems to be giving some credibility to the the uh, the nuclear uh, decay rates as uh, people use those to, to talk to, to come up with uh, <coughs> values. And of course, um, I don't know if you guys have any, anybody here from ICR, but you know, they can tell you all the ins and outs on all the assumptions that go along with the nuclear decay rates. And so, you know, there's always a, always a problem, but I did like Dr. Barry Centerfield's uh, you know, explanation. It, was, it sounded great, you know. So, I don't know who's right, uh, if it's Dr. Hugh Ross, I'm thinking of Russell, but Russell Humphreys, <laughs> not you, Ross. Russell Humphreys, or if it's uh, Barry Centerfield. For me, what's important is that we have we have uh, plausible answers. Okay? And again, whether it's you know this guy or that guy, but they're both plausible, and that's what I think what matters to me. Questions? Sorry. Yeah. Did it ever occur to you that the first two verses are not part of the first day of creation? Yes. Okay. It's separate and distinct. Yeah. And that would take care of a lot of that. It's built up in another book that I can tell you about, but I don't have the author. Right. Yeah, it's occurred to me, but I disagree with that. Yeah. And I disagree with it on, uh, on linguistic grounds. Because... Um, well, this guy's a Hebrew specialist. Is it Custance? No. No? Well, I would, I'd like to hear this Hebrew specialist, because, uh, I'm I'll not, give you my card and you'd call me later. Okay. I would love to, because I'm not convinced at all by that. Because well, what you have, 
is um, let's see here. Oops, that's not what I want. This <coughs> it's a little bit small, but this is fucking talking about Hebrew narrative. Now Hebrew narrative. In Genesis, one word it starts with the word oh, sorry, with the word bara, right here, and, it, and it's just in the simple past tense, and that's what we expect. Okay, that's what we expect. When we're talking about Hebrew narrative. Narrative is just telling a story. Okay, it's just any. Uh, it's not poetry. It's just narrative. Okay, so what we expect is we expect to see a simple past tense, and then it's going to be followed. Okay, it's going to be followed by what's called the sequential past tense. In fact, we see this throughout the entire chapter, as we see that there, this this uh, sequential past tense is marked by this what's called a, a vav haiku. Sometimes it's called or a sequential past tense. But you can see this. It's the Hebrew letter vav, and it's got this i. So vay, so it's vayikra, vayomer, vayas, vayas, vayikra, vayomer. And so this is this is what we see in the entire sequence of Genesis one. What we see in Genesis one one is a simple past tense. And this is how you tell a story in the, he, in the Hebrew Bible. You're going to start with what we call a simple past tense, and then you're going to continue with a sequential past tense. And so it follows perfectly. Now verse 2 has, what's, uh, has a parenthetical statement in it. In other words, the way that the Bob is placed right in front of the noun tells us that that is a parenthetical statement. So the first thing that we see is that God created the heavens and the universe. Okay, or the heavens and the earth, excuse me. And then we're thrown in verse 2, and he says, well, what did I mean by earth? What did I mean by earth? Well, by the way, this is what I meant. Earth was this. That's my parenthetical statement. And then it jumps back into the action. Verse 3 starts with then. And in English, six then right. down. Right. They're separated from those first two verses. In English. In English. <coughs> yeah. So the significance of that is, sorry, I'm trying to no, catch myself okay. up to speed. So the, you said it's so that, uh, in English. So basically, we're, we're losing in the translation then in into the original meaning of what was Correct. written there. Yeah. Ultimately, by the Holy Spirit, but also by who He directed, to what it's supposed to mean, not just what we translated it as meaning, but what it's really supposed to mean. You have to go back to the original to get it. Yes. When we, when we start making arguments on this on this scale, okay, we're we're you know talking about very uh, technical issues. We have to go back to the, the original language to get these. And you know, if we all agree, then we can all be happy on the English. But <coughs> and at this point. We have to go back to the Hebrew and really see what it says. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I respectfully disagree with, with your friend uh, based on. Well, you need Hebrew. to read his book. What's that? You need to read his book. Okay. Well, he should read my book. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've read some books on this, and I've been challenged by men that uh, are very good at what they do. And so, um, but it's, um, yeah, this is a very important point to understand that the, the way the structure of the Hebrew is set up is that it, it, it makes perfect sense by saying that in Genesis 1-1, that's, it starts out with a simple past, that's what we expect. Verse 2 is a parenthetical statement, and then we get into verse 3. So the first act... The first thing that God did is in Genesis 1-1. Okay? Verse 2 is a uh, verse to explain what did I actually mean by earth? Did I mean this stuff that we're standing on? No. Not at all. That's, that's God's telling us. I didn't mean this, you know, the brown stuff underneath our feet. I meant really something different. And then he and then he goes on and then verse 3 starts telling us what else he did. So, great question. Anything else? Yeah? Can you I had a question. You, you mentioned the... Uh the early church fathers and how they interpreted uh, the days of creation. And it seems to me, maybe a little bit more to the point, 
Um, would it be safe to say that there's no doubt that Moses himself intended those verses to be understood the way we would take them literally, and that people for thousands of years uh, understood them to be talking about, you know, the way that the way that the creation was put together? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. That we're it, we're supposed to take it literally, face value. Uh, that's what they're all telling us. Certainly, Martin Luther comes right out and said, you know. <coughs> Why would you even think anything else? Because I, I forget the, guy who, the name of the guy who mentioned it, but he made a really profound, uh, very simple point, but that the meaning of the text uh, uh, was established when it was written. It's not how we want to look at it today. It's what yeah. did the, the, the author mean when he wrote it down? Right. And I just can't buy the idea that Moses, writing you know, so long ago, could possibly have been trying to to get across any of these uh, ideas that we hear today that try to stretch this, this time period out. I mean, yeah. he could have said that so simply in other ways if sure. he wanted to. So. Yeah, I agree. He could have just come out and said, I, I, think, I think, but that's the whole point, is that God twice said, you know, you shall work six days, take the seventh off, because mm -hmm. I created in six okay. days. I think so yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, one more question, I'll leave you alone. Yeah. Um, could the phrase in Job, referring to Leviathan's tail, um, as a cedar, yeah. could that um, be uh, kind of like a, a similar linguistic construction, like a, like a simile, um, similar to the phrase in Peter, a day is as a thousand yeah. years? Of course. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. You okay. know why? Because you didn't have a tail that was made of wood. Right, okay. It's like... Okay. A cedar. Okay. But what if I say it's like a cedar versus okay. it's like a twig? Right. What's the picture you okay. have in your head? You're thinking cedar. Ooh, right. big tree. Right. Okay. You're thinking very big tree, big okay. tail. Versus a <laughs> twig tail like it's a twig. You're thinking oh, in not that big of a why are you talking about his tail? You know? So okay, so if you say, yeah, of course it's a symbol. That's the whole point. It's, and that's why people try to say, oh, this has to be a myth, because it obviously wasn't a cedar. Well, of course it wasn't a cedar. It was like a cedar. That's the point. It was like a cedar. It wasn't a cedar. It's not an equal sign. It's like a cedar. Right. So to follow that up, then, is, it, is there any chance that the scripture could be using a poetic or metaphorical reference there instead of a literal? Well, you have to understand that we use simile all the time. We use figures of speech, but we're all talking literally. You know, if I say well, you're barking up the wrong tree, <laughs> it doesn't mean that I'm not trying to talk to you, okay? I'm just I'm using a figure of speech and expression to get a point across. Okay? But I still might be, you know, bad as can be, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. Okay, so just just because we use figures of speech or similes or metaphors doesn't mean that we're all speaking poetic. And even if it was poetic, so what? And you have Exodus 14 and 15 right next to each other. They're both talking about God just taking them through the Red Sea. 14 is done in very descriptive, historical, prose, language, narrative, you want to call it. Whereas 15 is, it even says, and Moses sang this song. Okay? This is the song of Moses, you see? And so that's done in a, in a form of poetry. But what are they? They're both talking about facts. They're both talking about a real event, something that really happened, that transpired. Okay, so whether just because it's poetry doesn't mean that it didn't actually happen. Now sometimes, like, you know, like, certainly there are personifications in scripture, trees clapping their hands. And, you know, I mean, I've never seen a tree clap its hands. I personally don't think I'll ever see that. You know, but you know, so I don't think that's going to really happen. Okay, but but here we don't have that. We don't have a personification. God says, "Hey, look at this animal." So I don't think that I don't think you can say that that's just uh, you know, a, a whatever. I don't even know. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's a God says for the evening and the morning, I have a verse and second day. I think it's in Matthew somewhere where it said, aren't there 12 hours in a day? There's a scripture there. Uh -huh. so that kind of defines it, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the question of 12 hours by day and by night is more, it goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. They understood there to be 12 hours in a day and 12 hours in a night. So it's defining so, it. Before. Yes. It's, all hours. it's proving there is that evening of the morning. There are 12 hours in a day. Sure. Yeah. Hours in a day. Yeah. And we're
we're just talking about the revolution of the Earth, you know, once it's on its axis, that's the day. So that's all we're talking about, is the time it takes to go around once. So, yeah, I think, you know, yeah, days are much off. Yes? Um, I, that verse where it says, I made it along with you, Joe, you and Joe. Yeah. Now, is that you, like you, or is that you as in you? Like, I made him along with humanity at the same time, or, or something, so you're all on the, you're alive at the same time. Are you saying, I actually came up with a beast? the day you were born. You know, like, was it literally Job, or is it saying figuratively the human race was made within the same time frame approximately that, that the dinosaur race was made, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. which is, does it, do we know from that passage, or? Um, give me a second, I'll look it up. It's kind of like, and that other thing with the, with the word usage is kind of like, I can say that it's, it's uh, something is blacker than the ace of spades. Well, sure. Yes. So I, before you move well, on, the, the issue is still that it's black. Is that, whether it be the ace of spades or whether it be, you, you know what I mean? Would, would that be the same thing of what you're saying earlier? Well, let me just, I'm not going to move the slide. Though. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, talking about Job singularly. Really? Yeah. So we're talking about the, the race of, of dinosaur beings that was made around. Well, no, I don't. I mean, this and that's the language that's made. You know, it's I not mean, necessarily referring to time at all, all, is it? Sorry, I mean, it's not necessarily referring to time at all. Only yeah, I don't think it's. Both, both of them yeah, I don't think it's. You know, because he didn't. He didn't create Job. He didn't make Job. Uh, okay. Out of the dust. I, I'm just trying to do a preventive message because so, I know I'm going to be hit with that at some point no, in time, so I want no, to know. And the, and the word create, create out of nothing is not in view here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, in Ephesians, there's a point made that uh, God knew you before the foundations of the world. Yeah. Well, so it would sort of be on the same line. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, uh, God's not saying that he created Job, you know, some... 80 years earlier, whatever, whatever you made it. Question? Yeah? <coughs> the white versus the yellow, is that two versions of the Hebrew? No, it's just, uh, this is Elohim, that's God. That's just so that it was supposed to be clear, maybe it's not clear enough, but Vayikra Elohim, Vayome Elohim, Vayaas Elohim, Vayikra Elohim. Oh, is that the verb in front then? Yeah, that's um, the verb. So that's, that's the verb. You know, it indicates the verb. Yeah. This is the, the the word and uh, literally can mean several things, but in this case, it, it it converts it converts the verb and it flips it around, and so instead of it being a future, it's now a past, and it's a consecutive. In other words, when I'm telling a story, if I start telling a you know something that I did first, I went out and did this, and then I did that and that. See what's happening is that you know first God did this. He created. And then, you know, at, when we go to verse 2, what do I mean by earth? This is what I mean. And then it goes on to, to do this. Can you recommend this in a couple of times? Uh, yes, I can actually. Um, if you go to uh, go to Biblical Ulpan, B-I-B-A-L, ulpan dot org, biblical food pond. You can go there and you can order uh, the book uh, Living Biblical Hebrew. Living. Yeah. B i b u i. Biblical food pond. U l p a n. B i b u l. B i b l. B i well biblical. B i b l i c a l. How would you spell that? <laughs> Whatever I said, I don't know. Uh, Ulpan. U L P A N. That Hebrew. Not org. Is there different? There's different levels of it, right? So when you're saying that that was great, like, are we talking ancient Hebrew? Or are we talking high? We're talking, or we're talking biblically. Yeah. Biblically. So it's not modern Hebrew. Not it's modern. Okay. Modern doesn't use these devices anymore. Oh really? Okay. A lot of the vocab is the same, but they wouldn't use. Uh, the same, the same thing. Um, if you guys are still interested on Genesis one two, I can just take you through 
this uh, just a couple just a couple series. I won't do the whole thing. Yet. I think a lot of people have have trouble understanding, you know, what is meant by this tohu vahohu stuff. So again, if we uh, We'll just quickly go back. Uh, first day, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so here's what he says. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. So here's your, your, your simple past tense word, bara. Okay? So then what we expect to see is that consecutive past tense. That's what I was telling you about. The consecutive. It has a vayomer, the va something. But then we come to, uh, I talked about bara a little bit. I won't go into that right now. Genesis 1, 2, because we have this vav right here, and this is in front of a noun, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't act the same as it does when it's on the front of a verb. When it's on front of this, it becomes, and, oh yes, let me tell you what I mean. Okay, it's a parenthetical statement. It's a, oh, by the way statement. Okay, you can put a BTW, by the way, what do I mean by earth? Well, this is what I mean. And when I said earth, again, guys, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not talking about this, the rocks underneath your feet. What I mean is the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then it talks about, so what is this tohu vavohu? So the earth was without form and void. And this is from a uh, theological rubric of the Old Testament. It refers not the result of a supposed catastrophe for which there is no clear biblical evidence, but to the formlessness of the earth before God's creative hand began the majestic acts described in the following verses. And as Jeremiah 4.23 indicates, the earth always has the potential of returning to Tohu Vavohu if God decides to judge it. And so it's really a parenthetical statement. It's, it's not this. Um, or it is this, was without form and void and not became without form and void. The Hebrew veha'aretz haita is what is grammatically known as a copulative clause. The Hebrew letter vav attached to the noun, that is the earth, uh, acts as a type of parenthetical statement that is to suggest a reading, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void. Okay, so again, that's your parenthetical. You put that in parentheses. Now the earth was without form and void. And here's what it looks like, really. Okay? That right there is tohu vavohu. That is without form and void. Think of it this way. In the beginning, God created Legos. Right. <laughs> there are no particular shape and no particular form. Here's the earth, guys. This is what he means. I created the earth. We think earth. But this is what he meant by earth. And then, okay, he says, you know, by the way, there are no particular shape, no particular form, but then he started to do stuff, all right? He started putting things together, and the Spirit of God was hovering on the face of the deep, and then things got a little bit better and more complex until you have uh, even Legoland, okay? <laughs> so really, that's the best explanation, I think, of Genesis 1-2, to understand what God meant by formless and void, okay? It's not this gap theory. It's not that, you know, somehow God was recreating. He was starting over after some bad experiment. There's nothing in the Bible on that. There's nothing that supports that. But God is saying, no, it started in Genesis 1, you know, I don't know, maybe hours or even moments later. I don't know how long it was, but it was less than a day, okay? He started taking that stuff that was a, just a big box of Legos, he started putting them together until he got something that was formed, okay? So that's really what it means. That's, and then we go on, and then we, uh, and then we come, again, to what I talked about, that, that sequential past tense. This is what we find in verse 3, the action picks up again. We had parentheses, we took a stop for a second, give an explanation, a definition, and this, is, this finishes it off. So, yeah? This is in your book? Uh, yes, the, the Legos are not, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the concept, yeah. <laughs> so, anybody else? Uh, you can create a piece of your hand and made it in there. 
Sorry? We created the pieces but hadn't made them anything. Made them. Exactly. You created the pieces. So you created you created the heavens, that space to work in. Now think about it. What was there before God created anything? Yeah. yeah. Often we think that there was this big vacuum of space, but there wasn't even that. And any good evolutionist that knows his stuff will agree with you. You see, because even space was in that little dot that they keep talking about that never existed, okay? <laughs> All right? So God created space, he created a dimension, and then he created stuff to work with. And that's called the earth in Genesis 1-2. Yeah. I always get when I see in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when you really look at it, there was a beginning, there was a God, not a bunch of gods, but God. Yeah. And he created, and he didn't say the heavens and Mars, he said the heavens and the earth. Yeah. So there's so much in that one verse when sure. you kind of look at it, and it kind of it defines uh, that he was already there before there was totally there was nothing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, then when you say heavens and the earth, if the heavens are space, as we know, whatever those words might mean, then earth must imply that all the material, at least the foundation of all the material. Yes. Now, is that the Big Bang, or were you, did you made a remark? No, I, I don't ago? believe in the Big Bang. No, I don't believe in the Big Bang. But I'm saying that even a Big Bang theorist would agree that space was not always there. That's all I'm saying. They believe that, that uh, space and material matter was all in a hyperdimension, sure. or fifth dimension, or whatever. Well, uh, another dimension. So. I don't want to belabor it, but. Sure. You don't believe if, if you don't believe in the Big Bang, is that based on scripture or, or is that based on more of a philosophical feeling about how things have to be in fact the source of your of of what's of like okay. why? if you don't believe in, in yeah. the Big Bang that yeah. science says is observable, right. which I always thought was great because yeah. science ran this whole thing and then they found the creation of the universe. Yeah. Something sure. that they never would have predicted. Right. And, and, and I was wondering what what's what's well, the source yeah. of the I mean I, w I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, reject everything out of hand. Uh, there's a lot of philosophy behind it that they just don't have answers. Oh yeah, no, I know. I, I think I some of the stuff they come up with is interesting and you know I, I'm not I can't judge and say that it's all wrong. Uh, but I can tell you theologically that, that you know, if anything okay. they found is true, it's because God's in it. And so okay. they didn't find it's because they left God out of it. Okay. But uh, my point is that, you know, you know, it's we have a parallel. Okay, there's a parallel, which is kind of nice, I guess. But God was everything. There was nothing else. And then he had to create a space where there could be other things besides just, you know, just him. You know? So it's kind of okay. hard. It's hard for my head to think about that. But yeah. Doesn't this kind of point out that danger of keeping one foot in the Bible and one foot in secular society and trying to please them both? Well, um, you know, I mean, we're in this world. In fact, the, the video that we watched, I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, but don't they have a tendency to pull us across that line? Well, we try to do that? I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough question. Uh, we want to start with the Bible. And uh, let the Bible be our guide for how we come up with our worldview. If there's anything that they come up with that happens to agree with that, great. You know, then I, I'm not going to reject it just because a secular scientist found something. But I'm going to reject it if it disagrees with the Bible. Okay. So the fact that they came to the origin of the universe, great. Right? Well, again, you know, we were always there. We knew that. We're not surprised by that. Um, so we don't reject that. But of course, we reject the idea that that it you know it all just somehow happened by chance. I mean, that's so you know there's a lot of things that that you you a lot of implications in your statement. But I think we have to take them one by one, case by case. You know, things at rest have to sit at rest. I don't understand how the Big Bang occurred based on that. Sure. Well, I'm not in any way advocating the Big Bang, so don't get the wrong impression. Uh, yeah? Uh, I think sometimes when we're, I, I wonder if sometimes when we're trying to mix and match and God plus a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of oregano and put it all together and you get what happened. Yeah. Um, I think the danger there is to uh, 
I guess I'm wondering if you agree with this, what I'm going to say is that the beginning was the beginning of what is. It's not the beginning of God. Right. It's not the beginning. It's just the beginning of what was made. And, and a lot of times we fudge that line a little bit when we're trying to put everything in and add to God and how it happened and add this explanation along with what Scripture says is that we forget that there was before anything was. Like God was, like you just said, God was there. Right. Like before there was anything that was created, right. he, he was there. So it, his existence and his creation and everything that's about him, which is what creation should come back to tell us, which is attributes of the Lord and so on. I, I, I think we can lose that clarity yeah. there sometimes. Yeah. With that, would you, would you agree with that, or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, God is there's no beginning to God, and so when we talk about the beginning, we're talking about everything that's created. You know? Right. God is outside. Good time, I said, because that's yeah. what the beginning means. The beginning right. of time before yeah. Yeah. God's outside of time. Yeah. We create yeah. time and space. Time. Yeah. So you can say in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth did not imply that that had anything to do with when God started. At the beginning of time, He created time. Yeah. Without, without material things, there is no time because we, we measure time by things moving. That's true. Yeah, well, said. well, you guys have been very kind, and thank you very much.